Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me for another episode in the Conversations with Alan series. I'm Alan Locker, and I'm the child of two Holocaust survivors. I created this series to have honest discussions about the rise of anti-Semitism and hate with high hopes that it leads to conversations that make us all think about our own place in shaping history and to inspire collective action to eradicate hate in all its forms. My guest tonight is a remarkable woman and a Holocaust survivor herself. Dr. Eliza Erber's journey is nothing short of extraordinary. Forced into hiding in Holland during World War II, she endured unimaginable hardship as her family was forced into separate locations, including herself living in an underground bunker in the Dutch woods. Tragically, she lost her father, Richard Levy, at Auschwitz. Today, at 80 years old, she is not only a survivor, but also a rabbinic pastor, college professor, Hebrew teacher, playwright, actor, and former podiatric physician. Her remarkable resilience and dedication to educating future generations about the Holocaust just earned her the Torch of Freedom Award at the 2024 Forbes 3050 Summit in Abu Dhabi earlier this month. Eliza is here to share her personal journey as a hidden child and as a child of Holocaust survivors. Her mission to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and educate others about its horror is more crucial now than ever in the face of rising anti-Semitism worldwide. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Eliza Erbert to the Conversations with Alan. Hello there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It's pronounced Aliza. 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 Yeah, it's, it's Aliza. Israeli, and it means it means joy. Well, you are joy, pure joy, Aliza. It really means you know. As I connected with you on the phone prior, having a not only a Holocaust survivor for this series, but somebody like my parents who is from Holland really means so much to me personally. Thank, so thank you. you. I, you know, let's start about um, the Live to Tell project because Jillian Laub's Live to Tell project is how I found you. There was a great article in New York Times that featured you. Um, tell us about this project and, you know, we'll go from there. Well, uh, it, it's an amazing project, by the way, and she's not finished with this project. She's uh, going on to Israel to uh, film and interview Holocaust survivors there because the largest body of survivors is in Israel at this point. So um, Jillian's uh, project had to do with filming uh, Holocaust survivors and interviewing us and uh, then projecting us on different facades of buildings, including the Brooklyn Bridge. And let me tell you, if you have never seen your face projected on the Brooklyn Bridge. Here, here it is right oh here. My goodness, I see it, yes. So it, it was very emotional and very incredible to see it. And if, as you can see, there's a quote, there's some words next to mine. Uh, it was it was not okay then. It's not okay now. Right, because what's happening now is absolutely not okay. Yeah, here's uh, a, here's the, another one at the Whitney Museum. Right. <laughs> Jillian was asked why she chose to do it on the facades of buildings, and she said that the experiment that they did when they put the the, the pictures of the hostages everywhere. People tore them down. People defaced right. them. People disrespected uh, the entire project. And she figured that this way, there is no way that anyone can deface it. I can't, I can't see anybody climbing up to that Brooklyn Bridge. No. Know, I, I can imagine the impact for you seeing that live in person. Myself and, and the others, uh, whoever was able to show up for the first gathering when the press was there. Uh, 
I, I met three others and it, it was it was emotional. It is so emotional because the topic in itself already is emotional. We was we are survivors of a horrific event in history, you know. And uh, we were all very young, of course, at that time. It's over 80 years ago now. So it was a very emotional. And Jillian did an amazing job by, by doing it. It was beautiful. And it's, it's, it's how I, you know, became aware of your story. Um, as I said in the intro, you just received the Torch of Freedom Award a few weeks ago, along with Nadia Murad in Abu Dhabi. Um, what did it mean for you to be there and to receive the Torch of Freedom Award? My daughter, Lori, my second daughter. And this is Nadia me, right here. This is uh, Nadia. This is, Miss, this is Miss Murad, who received the other Torch of Freedom Award. Uh, a young woman who was for a, a year held by ISIS and tortured and raped and just a horrible, horrible stuff going for her. And she wrote a book uh, called Last Girl, Last Girl by Nadia Murad. And I'm hoping that people will buy it. It's on Amazon and, and read it. By the way, the foreword for her book is by, um, oh my God, I'm, go I'm having a, a bad senior moment. Um, uh, 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 um, I can't see. Amal Clooney. Oh, wow. The Amal Clooney. So uh, in, in, it's a nicely written book. It's a well-written book. It's a tough book to read. Um, but she wrote it, and she more than anything deserves to get the award. For me, as I started to say, Lori said to me, it feels like for me it was a validation. And she was right. That's the word that best describes what was going on emotionally when I received this award. Um, do you want me to tell you about my first two years in Holland? Because it connects with that. Y yes. Or uh, do you want to go in a different order? It's fine, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, let's, you know, your 81st birthday is April 2nd. You were born on April 2nd, 1943, at the height of World War II. And I've heard you say that your first day on Earth should have also been your last. Can you describe that and, and, and take us through those first two years? Yes. Um, the difficulty was when I was born, Holland had already been under occupation the Nazi occupation for three years. So Jews were trying to find hiding places, struggling to maybe leave the country, but by that time it was already way more difficult uh, to do that. Now, uh, my mom, when she got pregnant with me, um, the other members of her family already had secured hiding places here and there, my, they arranged it. Yeah, everyone in a different place. No one knew where anyone was because according to uh, my grandfather, if you didn't know, you couldn't divulge any information if you were caught. So um, they had to go into hiding and there I was newly born and there was no place for me. There literally was no place. But what they, the underground in Holland did was they dug holes underneath the ground, like a square hole, and it was covered with dirt and grass on top. But it had no windows, no doors, so the air was piped in from the side. If this is the side of the bunker, and that's the bunker is here, we are here, and that's the side outside of the bunker, they dug, uh, they put a pipe down the side and then bent it into the hole we were at. Um, so this uh, doctor who, together with two nurses, uh, took in into one of those bunkers. He was part of the underground, uh, 10 babies 
and I was one of them. I was seven months old uh, when I was first put into that bunker, and I didn't uh, emerge out of it until I was two. Um, no light, no sun, no sky, no people. Um, it literally, people ask me what my first language was. I tell them mute. I had no language because you, it, they taped our mouths shut because sound carried, you know, especially through those pipes that they had there. So sound carried above. And um, so whoever came down once a day to feed us, which by the way, were boiled tulip bulbs and grass. That was my diet for the first two years of my life. Um, they didn't talk to us. They just fed us and disappeared again. And, and I couldn't see, it was pitch black down there. So th that's what it was. It, that was my first two year environment. You know, it was, the more I understand about the ramifications of that kind of a beginning, the uh, more upset I get <laughs> in some ways, you know, because I understand how, how absolutely horrible this was. And then my mom said that that's another whole story. They, they snuck. Holland was liberated in two stages. You probably know this. I was in the still occupied part of Holland in that bunker and uh, my mom and part of, part of the people of the underground were in the liberated south in Maastricht in that area uh, of Holland. So this man Bert who was part of the underground, he wasn't even Dutch, he was part of the Brigada, the British army Jewish unit of the British army. So they sent him to Holland to, I think, train the underground with weapons use because he got trained by the British. I, I'm, I'm not telling it very well. I'm sorry. I hope it's not getting very confusing. No, no, no. Uh, but so uh, he met my mom and part of his job was also to help liberate people from concentration camps to smuggle them out. And that was his first mission. But then he also found out about me. And I think he fell with, in love with my mom right away. And he stuck around. And um, they ended up getting married. And this is the man I called my Abba, my father. Uh, and we went to Israel together. He was very Zionistic and a very, you know, Jewish state, he felt very strongly that it needed to, to be. So they snuck into the north. They found me. By that time, the bunker had been found. And uh, people want to know if I know how many of the babies survived. I don't. There was no one to tell me, but someone took me. And that's how my, my mom then found me. And they brought me to the south of Holland and shortly after that, uh, Bert, my stepfather, or I call him my father, my Abba, uh, secured passage on an Exodus type ship to go to Israel. I was just shy of three years old then. How did they know really that you were their child at that point? Were there, <laughs> do you know that? Cause I, I, I it, that didn't dawn on me before when we spoke, but babies, are hard to to some Identity. degree. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I look, I still look a little bit like my baby pictures. <laughs> so my mom had a couple of pictures of me when I was six and seven and months old, and then when she found me again at two, I I I I hadn't really changed that much. One of the things that people don't connect with necessarily is the fact that I didn't learn to crawl, I didn't learn to walk. I didn't learn to sit. We were prone that entire time. And, and, and as you said earlier, to speak. And I had no language. Yeah. I had no language. I mean, it's right. an interesting question about how many survived because not only the difficulties of, of where you were, 
the fact that you are alive from just being fed on that, laying prone, not having, you know, I mean, you are a, a testament to so much, you know, because that type of start. is a terrible start, um, but I'm here. You know, I'm here. And you're telling your story. And, and I'm telling the story. One of the things they asked me in Abu Dhabi that, that I talked about in my talk was that who knew that hate can lead to concentration camps, that hate can lead to, to the murder of 12 million people, six of them being Jewish. Out of the six million, one and a half were children. One and a half million were children that were murdered, murdered. So I, I told everybody uh, during my talk, I said, one of the ways to eradicate hate is possibly enroll in a dissection class of anatomy in a medical school. Because once you dissect the body, you realize they're exactly the same underneath the skin. There's no difference. We all have exactly the same, the same stuff. And that, hate, that was, I listened to your speech and that you really did. hit me. That, Yes, we are all the same. Exactly the same. You know, the colors inside is exactly the same for everyone. And yes. dissecting, I, I dissecting all of us in a in a medical classroom, you see that we are all the same and we bleed the it's, same it, color. It, it, exactly, exactly. And and hate is a human learned thing. Yeah. We're taught it, it, to do that. It's and, and you see a, some of those little kids when they, they're being taught to raise the guns and to they're wearing the little bandanas around their heads and that's teaching a child to hate. Correct, correct. You I like I it. said, you turn eighty-one in April and you continue to speak up and use your voice. What do. what drives that for you? It's, I don't even know if I can describe it. It's so important to me to do that. Uh, it, it's possible that I was so invisible in the beginning of my life that now I need to be out there teaching people, educating people, telling people that you can't treat a human being like they don't exist. They do, you know, we do. And I, I, I have over 20 people in that um, Holocaust group that I facilitate, that we facilitate in New York. And mine is the only experience. Everyone's experience is tough. Everyone's being taken away from your family, being taken away from your parents, being put in an orphanage or being put in a nunnery, a convent. All of those are very, very hard. And what's even harder is that then all of a sudden your mother or your father or your aunt come back and want you. And who are you? You're a stranger. You know, especially if you had a good life with the people who took you. So um, it, it, it's to me, it's, if we teach our kids to enjoy their teddy bears rather than a gun, we succeed a lot. It's very important for me to talk. It's very important. I have a voice now. Well, I have uh, a voice. I have a voice. Grateful. That, that I write. You are you doing it? My play is about to become a film. So it's being filmed as, you know, right now. Uh, I'm hoping within two months it'll be done. Uh, my writing, I'm hoping to get it into Tablet a Magazine now and, and Lilith. So, and it's all of, because of all of what's happening, you know, the, the, so it, it, it's, a, it's a method of teaching as well by writing and, and teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, to me, it's very important because I worry about the Holocaust retreating into some obscure place in history when there's a lot of people who try to try to deny it ever happened. Oh well, my god, absolutely. Speaking yeah. of education, 
you, you say that it's just as important to talk about the horrors of the Holocaust as it is to talk about the heroism. Can you talk about both? Well, most people who have heard about the Holocaust, and I can't imagine there are people around that haven't, unless they're very young, um, already know about the concentration camps. The concentration camps were absolute horror, hell, absolute horror. Uh, I, I have nightmares about my own father and great-grandmother, who wasn't even Jewish, who was shoved into the gas chamber of Auschwitz at 85. At 85, why bother? But, right. okay. <sighs> When I get upset, sometimes I, I go a little blank, so forgive me. Um, remind me what I was talking about. The, the, talking about the horrors as well as the heroin. Right. right. So everybody knows more about the horror of it. But within the camps themselves, there was heroism. People helping other people. People trying to, to, to heal other people or holding them up during roll call because if you fell down, you got a bullet and that was it. You know, see, that's heroism. Or I, I just read an account of, of three women who gave birth in concentration camp and managed to, with help, hide the babies who survived. Uh, the babies survived, all three babies survived and met and, 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 and that's a whole big story in itself. Um, so that's heroism. Heroism also is for the people who uh, went on to build a new life. How much strength of character and emotional strength did it take to move on knowing that your first family was murdered or your children were killed? How much strength does it take to then Pick yourself up and say, I have to make this a meaningful life. Without meaning, there is no life. We have to make this a meaningful life. Let's move on. Let's either build the land of Israel, which so many did, uh, help the survivor. You know, it's just so many acts of heroism that I think are heroic. You know, uh -huh. you know of course, there were people who couldn't. They were too traumati traumatized. But there were so many who were her heroes, I think. Like, like my father, uh, the one who was murdered at Auschwitz. He survived four concentration camps before he caught typhus and then died. You know, or, or the people who were shoved into the gas chambers, they couldn't do anything. about. It. Once you were there, you, you died. You couldn't do anything. But for the others... They fought within the camp. They, 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 they started new lives. They went back to find their families. I mean, they really showed resilience and, and strength. And, and everyone around me in Israel were people like that. They had numbers on their arms, which I thought was normal when I was a little kid, you know. But it wasn't normal. Right. You I mean, know? if we see things... And no one explains it. Yes, you would think yeah, it's, it's 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 not normal. You know, it's yeah. not normal. Yeah. So it took that's you what a, I mean a, by heroism, right? Absolutely. It took you a long time to feel you had the right to call yourself a survivor. I still struggle with that. <laughs> wow. <sighs> I lived in oblivion for a very long time about all of this. 15, um, if I'm not mistaken, right? What? You were 15 when you really learned? Yeah, actually 16. Yeah, it was. I was actually 16. I stayed, my mom just, we, we, had, we were having a talk and she just blurted it out and, whew. but, I, 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 like I said, I lived in oblivion. I didn't know. And then being hit literally straight between the eyes saying, Bert's not your father. 
who's my father? Where's my father? What happened to my father? Why don't I, you know? And why didn't I know? I, I, I tell, or I would like to suggest that if you adopt a child or if you have a situation, don't keep the facts from the child. Let them know gently as they grow just enough so that they know how loved they are mm -hmm. by being taken in, you know, and, and stuff like that, because that, that was a difficult, a very difficult experience to, to find out like that. When did you first start accepting that you had the right to, to call yourself a survivor? I'm still struggling with it. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, everyone say, tells me you are a survivor, you know, especially when I joined that group originally. Um, but I knew that there were so many things about my psyche that were not okay. But going to a psychiatrist was a no-no because I grew up in a, in a German, Viennese, Austrian, Dutch family and you don't talk about those kind of things, you know, no, no, no. And uh, I, I, I needed to find out why, why I felt I was different or strange. It has nothing to do with my theater. You know, all theater people are a little off the whatever, but it had nothing to do with that. You know, <laughs> it's just, I always felt inside that something was percolating there and I didn't know what it was and when I started doing research about my family and I found 11 names on the new names monument in Amsterdam and that's only in Holland then we had relatives my father's family was in Germany they also were all murdered the family in Poland they also were all murdered my father Bert's mother and sister were taken from Vienna, taken to a forest and shot point blank, dead into a pit. He lived with that after he found out. That's heroism too, to be able to continue and living with such pain. Um, so I, I guess, I can say that I begrudgingly accept the fact that I am a survivor because I am. I know that I am. I pulled myself through all of the weirdness mm -hmm. and, and ended up being pretty smart, regardless of the fact that I had no language. You know, I got a scholarship to university. I, 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 I write. I became a physician. I'm also a doctor, by the way. So I, I became I, a physician. I, I... I'm also, I, you know, I think. Right. I, I mean, that is incredible for starting I out. To prove, I needed to prove something to myself, to, to, to whoever. I needed to prove that I was smart. I was here. I was alive. And that, I think, was when I started saying, okay, it's all right to call yourself a survivor. You know, okay, you weren't in concentration camp, but starting your life in total isolation, starvation, deprivation, and silence, that's not okay. No, it's definitely not. You said you were, I think you were making a speech somewhere when somebody stood up and, and said, you know, uh, sort of like, you know, why do you have the right and, or what do you know? And you really set out on a mission, I think at 29 years old, to learn everything you could. But the man was think? right. The man <laughs> was right. But think about it. I was 29. I just found out a little bit here and a little bit there. And I thought I should talk about it, right? He was right. I did not have the information. I did not have the knowledge. I did not have a foundation. And you need a foundation. So I decided to educate myself. And boy, I'd never stopped. <laughs> well, what, what was that learning journey like? How did you, where did you begin to? I, I began 
maybe 30 years ago, something like that. Um, 25 years ago, I was in a play and it was a Holocaust play. I had a very intense role in it. And part of the, the play went to Europe to be performed at the second international Jewish arts festival. And we were invited. And part of that was a trip to Terezin, to Wiesenstadt concentration camp. And something very weird happened to me when I was there. When we went into the, you know, those bunk tiered, the tiered mm -hmm. bunks, those rooms that everybody has a picture of. And I just knew that my father must Here are have some been there. I didn't know yet. Those but rooms that everybody has it from the web. Something's talking. I think I, my phone. I think Siri just was talking oh, for okay. no reason. So, so um, when I was there, I had just learned the Kaddish it was before I became a rabbi, a rabbinic pastor, and uh, everybody sort of left, but they didn't really, I just didn't see them. I was so emotionally overcome that I stood in the corner because they filmed me and I didn't know. I stood in the corner and I said Kaddish for, you know, for my father, for Richard Levy. And uh, after that, I went to a little records room where they kept ledgers, the ledgers. Uh, mm -hmm. That young lady, beautiful young lady sitting there. She was wearing a light blue dress is what I remember. I gave her Richard's name and within a 20 seconds, she bent down, she pulled out a ledger, opened it up, opened it up to page six and number 12 was my father. Number 12 was my father with his date of birth, where he was born, and a series of other numbers, which I, I, I'm not quite sure what they all were. But that's, that was like lightning wow. for me. And when I came home, it took me a year and a half to write my play, which by the way, went through transition because from a seven character play, I turned it into a one woman play and that's what's being filmed now. Yeah, don't, I, I, I thought my director was absolutely nuts when she asked me to do that, you know. Um, but th that's, that's when things became really serious. And that's also when I decided to start speaking more seriously about it and to share what I learned, what I knew. I used to sit in front of the computer writing, when I was writing my play, I used to scream at the computer and cry. I was so... It was so raw. To you do needed that. a place to express your emotions. Exactly. So thank goodness no one else was around. So I could <laughs> scream as much as I wanted. But uh, it was us. And also when I was in rabbinical school, um, I learned a lot. One of the motivation forces was to learn about hatred of the Jews. What is it? What is it? Why is it? I haven't found anything yet to tell me why we as a people should be so hated. Because if anything, we only put forth good in the world. You know, forefront in medicine and in and, and, and IT and, and all of that. We add to the world. We don't take away from the world. And I don't, I don't get it. I may never understand it. Maybe someone younger than I will figure it out my grandson but this is the truth that's that's so for the past 25 years i've been very very seriously studying i have a gazillion books about the holocaust almost every book that's been written including stories of, of just lay people who wrote their stories um and now i'm in the process of writing my own story aside from the play and aside from my talks i'm also doing that so we'll see. Yeah. Well, and, that, and, and that is really uh, incredible that you're doing it because that will live on when you are unable to continue speaking in person. That is your story and it needs to live on. Um, you know, you talk about your dad. I mean, he, he was at three concentration camps and died at Auschwitz for 
from typhus and at Auschwitz he died of typhus yeah. and and he but he was um working for the resistance right and the dutch underground what what do you know about his story i mean i know from my my dad's story uh, the Dutch underground helped him reconnect with my grandparents. Well, Richard Levy, my bio, my biological father, did not survive, so I never met him. I never met him, um, and and my mom would not talk about any of it. She was silent, so she wouldn't talk. I mean, she she when the uh, Eichmann trials came on in the United States. And I wanted to watch them. That was before I knew very much. I was 15 years old. And she would go into hysterics. She said, I live to it. I live to it. I don't have to watch it again. I don't have to hear it again. So my dad, who, who, who did want, um, went somewhere else to watch the trials. And our TV was silent because she couldn't handle, she couldn't handle it. And I don't blame her. She went through an awful lot. And I haven't even talked about my mom. Uh, but she she features very prominently in the play, so uh, and what she went through. Uh, she was nineteen when I was born, so she was a kid, you know. But and, and separated from her child. Separated from her husband first, then her chi and her child. No. Her husband first, and then I was born after he was taken already, uh, and then her child, and, and literally taken away. She didn't want to separate from me, but they told her she had no choice because if she held on to me, how would she survive with an infant? I mean, she had to run away and hide in a forest and hide in empty barns, and she had no food. And how would she survive with, with a, a week old infant or whatever, you know? So they made her give me up. Very difficult, very difficult. How did you learn of your dad's um, work with the underground? Did somebody fill you in on that? Yes. Um, apparently, uh, my grandfather in Holland survived, my opa, and um, his his wife as well. She's my step-grandmother, but... She's my grandmother. She's my Oma. And um, so he told me a little bit. N nobody, nobody really talked about it much. So a lot of it had to do with research. I did find out that Richard was caught while doing a mission for the underground. He, his job was to smuggle people away and bring them to safety before. See, they had this whole network of finding yeah. out who was next scheduled to be deported or to be taken away. Um, and, and his job was to get to those families and those children and those people and take them to the next place that will then take them further on, possibly over the border or whatever. And um, so that's what he was doing. And at one such time, he was caught. He was caught and he never returned home. He was taken to Westerbork. Uh, in Holland, which concentration that's, camp. That, that's where my opa was. That's where I, I believe my opa died at, at Westerbrook. That was the main uh, concentration camp in Holland. There was one other one, but yeah. that was the main one in Holland. And it was, it started out more or less as a transition camp uh, because they, they held them there. And then from there, they sent them to Dachau or to Bergen-Belsen or to uh, Auschwitz. Um, and, um, so that's, that's what happened. Um, my mom and my father actually got married at Terezin, at Theresienstadt. She got special permission to go visit him when they figured out eventually where he was. Um, she got special permission and the camp, the Nazi camp commandant married them. I don't know if it was legal, but he married them. But can you imagine? And then, yeah. and then she she ended up pregnant, and he ended up being shipped away. In a way, in a way, eventually to Theresienstadt, and where he caught um, dysentery and typhus, and from the typhus, 
what happened was at Theresienstadt or Terezin is that a Red Cross army was coming to inspect. So all the sick people were shipped out to Auschwitz. And he being one of them. And that was his end for him. It's crazy. Um, after the war, you ended up in Israel for about 10 years. Um, one of our viewers, Maybeth, is asking, what were those early days like in Israel? Uh, I don't have great memory of that. And, and the interesting thing about traumatic loss of memory is that it reveals itself very slowly hmm. and when the time is right. But I do have some. Uh, I, I, I remember uh, Bert picking us up where the ship was. And uh, his sister, Hilda, who had survived, that sister had survived the war. She was in Israel already also. Um, so uh, the beginning was fine, but the problem, and I have a wonderful memory of that time, that we had a green grocer who would come down our dirt road. The streets weren't paved yet. Wow. That's how early it was. And in 46 or 47, and uh, he would come with this flatbed wagon loaded with vegetables. And he'd always pick me up and put me on his flatbed uh, and let me pick anything I wanted, which was usually a carrot uh, for me. He was so nice. He was an Arab merchant. And then in 48, he disappeared. He just didn't come any longer. Wow. I love that you remember the cart because... My mother arrived to the place she was hidden on a cart, and she does remember that. You know, she did remember that. Those, those flat carts. Yeah. 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 So interesting. And um, the donkey. Yeah. You, and, and you mentioned trauma. You know, you 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 said to me, you know, you you certainly do um, have PTSD. But what's really amazing at 80 years old, you are seeking therapy. And you told me that you wish you hadn't had been so stubborn all along, you know. And I, I told you, I, I, God, I wish my parents would have had that opportunity because what you all lived through, there's, there was no guidebook. My children are so much smarter than I am. I'll tell you that. Uh, are they? Are they who convinced you to to go? They recognized that mom had outbursts that were inappropriate to what was stimuli. And that's so part of traumatic stress disorder uh, and, and other, other things. And uh, eventually they said, well, you really ought to give it a try. And I was said, no, I, I, I can handle everything my, myself. I, you know, I'm strong. I'm, I can handle it. But it turns out that it's one of the best things I've ever done. I recommend everyone to find a proper therapist for you, the right person for you. Um, uh, if you have any emotional difficulty or psychologically struggling with something, get help with it. There's no shame attached to it, you yeah. know, and uh, do it. And it's helping me tremendously. It's opening up so many, it's peeling back layers for me. It, tears are coming to my eyes because I, you know, the way you just described yourself and what your kids were seeing. My mother was very large in that way as well. Things, you know, reaction to things that, you know. Yeah, I, I know that symptom very well. Um, I, I, I'm sad about it because I know that the kids got the brunt of it. My kids got the brunt of my eruptions. Um, on the other you, hand, you can't, I can't, you can't feel that. that. Yeah, I, 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 I no longer do it. I no longer tell myself you're a bad girl because I couldn't help it. It was not something, I didn't even know I was doing something inappropriate at the time, you know? Um, so my kids, my smart, beautiful children recognized, and, and, and they really are smart, but 
they also had a very different kind of beginning in life, you know? Well, um, I say we, we as second generation have that exactly. trauma, have that trauma as well to some degree. To a large degree. I <laughs> think to a large degree. I really, really do. Um, and, and, and now, you know, uh, even the third generation is beginning to talk about uh, the trauma. And if you read the research, you're talking about the genetic uh, component of trauma that can be passed on genetically. It alters your genetic makeup in certain ways of uh, severe trauma. And, you know, wow. so I don't know how many generations we have to go down for that to retreat enough. I don't know. Mm. Um, speaking of your kids and, and knowing that you, your family didn't speak about it, when did you first start speaking about it to your three children? Do you, do you remember? I don't think I specifically spoke to them first. I think I decided to speak to the world first. Wow. And um, I, I think that's how it came about. And of course, through my writing, I shared my writing with them. So they read tidbits, not the whole story necessarily, not the whole thing. Now they know. Now, obviously, it's, it, they, they know because they've heard my talks and they've heard my sharings uh, and they've read my poetry, uh, which deals with that as well. Um, but I don't think I ever sat down with them specifically. You know, I think I'm a coward that way. I didn't <laughs> want to. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's a coward. I mean, what you're doing is not cowardly at all. Um, you, you lived in Israel for 10 years. Um, I can't imagine what it was like waking up on October 7th to, to the horrors of what Hamas had done. But can you sort of take us back? It... Like everybody else, I don't know that I'm over it or that I'll ever get over it. Um, finding out about it left me physically in such a difficult place. I have some neurological problems at this stage in my life. It aggravated everything so badly that I could barely move, I could barely walk. Um, I, I, I kept crying, I couldn't, I'm a crier, I'm one of those people who bursts into tears a lot. It, it, it's still, it's still. That's why I say that all of those people who keep screaming ceasefire, 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 they're seeing what is given to them to see. By the media, yes. By social media. That's what they see. They haven't lived for 40 years where every day people were being murdered, their throats slashed, people coming into their homes and, and, and killing them in their beds. They have not been there. They have not seen that. They haven't lived that. So I think what is happening is awful. I think it's horrible, but not just for Gaza. Correct. Not just for Gaza. There are over 20,000 Israelis displaced. In the north, they can't live in their places. Okay, displaced children who are, keep running into the bomb shelters. How is that for a five-year-old and a 10-year-old? Mm -hmm hearing the, the, the bombs fall. I, I grew up hearing the bombs falling. And I'll tell you, it was horrible. It was horrible. I, I have a vivid memory of that for me. And I can't imagine now for so many, both in Gaza and in Israel, right. those children. Living it every places, day. Living, living it every it day. day. Yeah. You know? But yeah. they're not showing the Israeli side. They're only showing what's happening in Gaza. And it's awful. But I also know that 
Israel doesn't have that much of a choice. If I were the head of state, I don't know what I would do, how I would deal with it. I have a feeling I would also go after Hamas. Got to get rid of them because they promised they'd do it again. They did. And, again, uh, and they their, charter, their charter states that they want to do, you know, get rid of the Israel state, Israeli right. Jewish people. That's do you believe anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism? I don't think they're the same thing. I don't believe that I think Zionism has to do with a state of Israel being there. Because uh, Theodor Herzl was the head of the Zionist organization in 1893, I think it was, or 18-something, 91, um, when he got people together to, to talk about, that was after the Dreyfus affair, that he got the people mm -hmm. together to talk about we need a Jewish homes, homeland. Yeah. And that was after the pogroms in Russia. And, and so I don't think they're exactly the same. I think anti Semitism is purely against the Jew. If you're a Jew, you don't deserve to live. That's anti Semitism. Anti Zionism is, well, we don't want that state of Israel there. Let's sabotage it. Let the Jews go somewhere else. Right, right, right. Th that's er my definition. That's yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody's got there. Earlier you were talking about um, the group of survivors that you uh, get together with, which is part of the Hidden Child Foundation. How did that come together? And, and you told me backstage it's a group of infant survivors like yourself, correct? Yeah, the woman who started it together with someone else who's still in the group, um, Carla, who's now in her upper 90s, Carla started the group. She's from Holland as well. She was older during the war, she and her husband. And when they came here, she's a psychotherapist and she, or a social worker, I'm not quite sure. And she saw a terrible need for those who had no voice. I personally remember being told, oh, you were a baby, nothing. You're fine, you were a baby, you don't, you know. And I swallowed that. Oh yeah, I wasn't in concert, I was fine, I, I'm fine. Uh, and it, not true at all. Uh, babies get very traumatized but they have no way of expressing it. There's no way to talk about it. There's no way to understand what is happening to you. And it stays with you. It stays for the rest of your life. I can vouch for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Has yeah, that so, group been helpful to you? Well, yeah. Uh, I, I'm. Carla started it. And then when she had to retire from it, she asked me to take over. I, uh, I also do therapy and stuff like that. So I was sort of placed in, a, in a, an okay place uh, for that. Um, all of them carry trauma, all of them. Even the ones who were with foster families and treated well with the foster families the ones that tell me that then their own family came and wanted to take them away from the only mother and father they knew. Very painful. And they were already older now after the war. So uh, everyone in our group has suffered and they come religiously. We meet once a month and they come religiously. Now, as I said, we now just had a woman from Israel join us, from Israel. And we have people from Philadelphia. We have people from California, two sisters from California. Um, it seems to be very important for everyone. For me, uh, very important. I finally found a place where people understood. Mm -hmm. I could talk about this and they understood. And I was allowed to talk about it. I was encouraged to talk about it, which had never happened before. 
and I already had my children when I joined, you know, I was already an adult and I'm very dedicated to the group at this point. Yeah. Well, well, we are so lucky that you are using your voice to share your story. Eliza, truly, I am so grateful that we have met. I can't wait to see your, your movie. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. So my pleasure, so much my pleasure to meet you, Alan. And I think what you're doing is so important as well. You are a voice for people to come to listen, to hear, hopefully get motivated to be activists as well. It's important. It really is. You know, there really is no place for hatred. There's just... And you're honoring your family. You are honoring your parents. And I speak to honor my, my family and, and all those people who showed their resilience and their strength and, and, and the ones who died. And, and not just the Jews. I'm talking about the Roma, Sinti, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the six million others who died because of war. Well, I, I just got a message before uh, doing this from the granddaughter who hid my mother away because she is in Bunschow in Holland. And so she's asleep right now while we're doing this. And she sent me a message to send her the link so she could watch it in the morning. That's wonderful. I, I yeah. saw that episode when they visited you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I watched. It, it was very touching. Yeah. Very touching. Thank you. Thank Alan. you so much, Eliza. I hope My to see pleasure. you in person one day. Stay in touch. Let's make it happen. Okay. Be well. Right. Bye, bye bye. Thanks, everybody, for watching. As I always say at the end of conversations with Alan, as I leave you, remember we all have choices to make in life. Speak up do the hard thing, and let's all fight hate for good. I truly believe conversations like this can change the world around us. I hope you'll share these episodes with your friends and family. And until the next conversation, please stay safe.